Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So welcome to another episode of Christian Apologetics. And uh, tonight I wanted to share with you a topic that I hope is going to be a blessing, is going to be helpful and useful for you in your conversations with other Christians if ever this topic comes up. And uh, the topic is going to be praying to the saints. And the real question is, is it biblical? So does the Bible uh, teach? Does the Bible approve? Does the Bible endorse this practice that uh, it's done by Catholics and uh, Orthodox, even the Eastern Orthodoxes? Uh, does the Bible have anything to say about this? And, uh, and again, I hope that this can be something that you can think about uh, and you can research more. I will try to raise up two main issues that I find with this practice. And again, I will not, I will try to present, represent the issue as good as I can, uh, especially the, how Catholics uh, or how Orthodoxes see the praying to the saints. And hopefully, uh, again, this can give you some food for thought and you can read a bit more about this. And just let me know in the comments what you think about. Remember, this is all done uh, with grace, with love. This is not something like to attack uh, other Christians, you know, for the beliefs or saying, oh, you're heretical or you're not a Christian if you do this or no, uh, you know, we don't want to appear as if we're belligerent and we're attacking other Christians for their beliefs, but we just want to encourage dialogue and especially we're going to encourage um, clarification. And want to really see, okay, does the Bible really teach this? Uh, can we, can we uh, see, see the truth? You know, can we believe? Can we have our practices and beliefs? Can they be rooted in the truth of the Word of God rather than being rooted in tradition, maybe rooted in extra biblical sources that, yes, they might have very good things, but that at the end of the day, they're not actually rooted in the Word of God. So that's the, the whole point I wanted to, to make here. Now, the practice of praying to the saints, and I went here to catholic.com, it says here, the historic Christian practice of asking our departed brothers and sisters in Christ, which are the saints, for the intercession has come under attack in the last few hundred years. Though the practice dates to the earliest days of Christianity and is shared by Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and other Eastern Christians, and even some Anglicans, it still come under heavy attack from many within the process of movement that started in the 16th century. Uh, once again here, there are many assertions being made uh, just in this first part. It says here that it's an historical Christian practice and that even from the earliest days of Christianity, this has been something that was done. Now again, a very uh, a question arises uh, is that why is it then that in the New Testament we find no mention of Christians praying to that people for intercede for them? or that uh, Christians are engaging in this activity of praying to dead Christians, even to, to dead saints. Uh, why don't we have any evidence of this? And again, if you think I'm wrong, and if you think that in the New Testament, there are uh, verses, there are passages in which Christians are praying for dead people or are asking to dead Christians to pray for them, please let me know in the comments. Based on what I know about the New Testament, there are no such examples. Uh, and the examples sometimes are given are very stretched out and are very taken out of context. And uh, so again, I would already disagree with this statement. The fact that from the earliest days of Christianity, this is a practice that was already done. Uh, and, and again, why is it then that we don't have find any evidence in scriptures of this practice, if it's actually, actually something that the disciples themselves did? Uh, and again, the saints, remember, when whenever... We're talking about saints, we're talking about dead brothers and sisters. So people that are already falling asleep, as the Bible says, in Christ. So they were believers, but they have uh, they are they're dead now. And uh and again, something very interesting that we're gonna find always is that the bringing to them is very often uh changed in asking for their intercession. So many Catholics and Orthodox will say, Well, we're not actually praying to them as if you would pray to God, right? Because that would be like blasphemy. But we are asking them for their intercession because they are already in heaven, because they can hear us, because they can aware of us, and therefore they can intercede for us uh, to God directly. Exactly as you would ask a fellow Christian, right? In your community, in your church, you will ask someone to pray for you. Exactly in the same way, we're asking them to pray for us. And again, this um, 
th this idea of intercession is actually something very biblical, that we should pray for one another, we should pray for other people, even for our enemies. And I'm going to just lead some verses here. For example, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, exalt first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. James 5.16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, firm and prayer of a righteous man avails much. Or uh, Matthew 5.44, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And even in Acts 12.5, we have the example of uh, Peter. So, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And there are many other examples. These are just the main ones that I've, uh, I've listed. And so we can see that the scripture actually encourages us and commands us to pray for one another, to intercede for one another, that we should confess uh, our sins for one another, and that this is all done for our mutual edification, for our... Uh, for glorifying God, because this is something good that unifies the church. And, uh, and again, this is something that it's encouraged. But as you can see, in none of these passages, it's even mentioned the idea that we should pray, we should ask for prayer to a dead brother or sister. It's always referred to people that are living, right? To alive people. And so you're praying for a fellow brother and sister who is alive. You don't pray anymore for someone who is already dead, right? Um, there is no mention of that in the New Testament, at least. So uh, that's my point. And um, so the, the two big issues that I hope I'm going to bring to you today, and I hope that they can make you think, and they can make you food for thought, to reason, and to research more about this topic, is first of all this. Um, the, uh, if you just look at some examples of prayers given to Mary or given to other saints, you can clearly see that these are, are more than just asking for the intercession. Uh, Catholics, Orthodoxes, when they pray to Mary, that is considered not the highest saint, is considered the Orthodox, the mother of God, is considered to be sinless. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of dogmas about Mary, which, once again, uh, it's a separate video, but I could show you that just based on scriptures, scripture alone, we cannot really justify these dogmas. We cannot really find explicit a uh, biblical context that can allow us to draw such conclusions or to support such views and such dogmas uh, about Mary. But taking away that, um, the prayers that are given to her, or at least the, the intercessions or the uh, petitions, right, are more than just asking Mary, in this case, to intercede for you. There are more. Look at it here. There's an example of prayer to Mother Mary for protection. We fly to your protection most holy mother of god so again here is not like you're asking her to pray to god that god may protect you right but you're asking her directly to protect you so see the issue it's not merely asking to a dead to in this case mary to pray for you but it's more you want her to do something for you and that's why you're praying to her because you want her to do something and that's why if you take a look, there are so many different saints that you can pick and choose from depending on the situation, depending on your problems, on the difficulties, on your needs. And you can pray directly to different specific saints depending on your problem. And, uh, and this is a big, big problem, right? Because again, you want these saints, it's not really just asking them to pray for you as if you would do with a fellow brother or sister, right? That's living. But you're asking directly them to do something spiritual or to do something for you. Again, it says, please listen to our petition needs and deliver us from all dangers. Wait, what? So you're asking Mary to deliver you from all dangers as if she has some sort of power to intervene, to act in your life, as if she would be God. That, like, I, I'm confused, right? It seems more, this seems more than just asking for intercession. You wouldn't ever ask a fellow brother and sister to deliver you from all dangers, right? <laughs> so why do you do that to, to Mary in this case? And again, it seems that you're not merely asking for intercession, but you're asking more. You want her to do something. 
uh, and to use her power or authority or whatever to uh, to guide you or to bless you and to so not marry to pray for you but to do something and again it says ever glorious and blessed virgin mary so there is also this idea of veneration veneration uh, dedication honor exaltation of these saints uh, and uh, and again i just wanted to show you this there are tons of other examples i could use but just to show you that the prayers and here i've gone to actual prayers so i'm not making them up uh, it's more it's more than that it's more than just asking for intercession as if you would do with a an alive brother or sister it's something more uh, and again, uh, just an example, St. Joseph says here, O oh, glorious St. Joseph, though who has the power to render possible even things which are considered impossible. So again, like you are giving to a saint, first of all, you're calling it glorious. And then you're saying that they have the power, in this case, Joseph has the power to render possible even things which are considered impossible. Come to our aid in our present trouble and distress. So again, these are all things that we should be asking to God. So God has the power to render things possible which are impossible. God can come to our aid in our present trouble and distresses. Like if you read Psalms, Psalms is full of this. Psalms is never full of like someone praying to a dead person or to a saint to, to do this for them. It's always God. It's always directed to God. And that's why I said before that uh, even though in in uh, first sight, it looks like uh, Catholics and also say, but we're not actually praying to them as if we're praying to God. We're just asking them for their intercession. But if you look at their prayers, well, it's, it's actually a lot more than that. And that's the, the, the trouble that I see. Um, now, the second issue, right? I just I don't want to make the video too long. The second issue that I find is exactly the topic that is raised up here. So even if we grant that they... Uh, can uh, that we can you no know, ask for the intercession and that these prayers some, somehow represent uh, asking for their intercession uh, to God. But can they hear us? Or are they aware of our prayers? Of their, of our prayers you know? Can they uh, listen to our prayers? Can they communicate with us somehow? And therefore, they, can they then communicate to God? And uh, the answer to this is by Catholics and Orthodox, of, of course, yes, because they are already in heaven. That's the first thing that they say. Um, and uh, they use this chapter, this verse from Revelation 5, 8 to justify the fact that the saints are aware of our prayers, that they can listen to our prayers, and that therefore that's why they can offer them to God. And um, and then if we go a little bit further right here, uh, they are already in heaven, they are already immortal, they're already glorified, and therefore they're not limited anymore to the restrictions of space and time. So that's why they can hear even to... Uh, multiple prayers at the same time uh, God no, is willing so God is allowing them is giving them the ability to communicate with us with others in heaven or with us and again they are already in heaven um, so they are already in this glorified state in heaven in the presence of God and again this is something that I say okay is this biblical though so does the Bible teach that all those Christians who have already passed away uh, and have already died believing in Christ, does the Bible teach that they already are in the presence of God, that they already have their immortal, incorruptible, glorified bodies, and they're already in the presence of God, enjoying the presence of God? Is that really what the Bible says? And unfortunately, the answer is uh, no. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to go to the passage of Revelation chapter 5. I don't know why I said uh, 8 here. Uh, this is uh, the verse. And I'm going to just uh, look at it. Now, again, context. Here is John's revelation about the end times. This is specifically the throne, uh, around the throne room, where pretty much God the Father is seated in the in the in the throne. And then there is the Lamb Jesus with the Holy Spirit, with the seven spirits of God, and uh, there are the four cre um, living creatures around the throne who are worshiping God. And then there are the twenty-four elders. So these are the, and then the angels. So these are the figures that we find in this scene. And then there is of course John. Uh, and now here in this case, Jesus is taking the scroll, right? So when Jesus taking the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamp, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And this is the passage that the Catholics and Orthodox will focus on saying, see, the, the saints in heaven, in this case, uh, the passage is only talking about the four living creatures and the 24 elders. There is no mention of other saints 
there is a mention of Mary, there is a mention of saints, of dead people that are already there. Uh, there is a mention of that. But uh, excluding that, it says here that they have these bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, which represents the prayers of the saints. And again, I hope that just some basic philosophy and logic uh, can allow you to see how uh, from this passage to say that therefore the saints in heaven or the elders and the creatures are aware and they can hear the praise of the saints is a complete non sequitur. So just because they have the golden bowls, which are the praise of the saints and they're offering it to God, does not mean in any way that they are aware of these prayers. They are aware of the content of the prayers, that they can hear the saints of their, as if they're saying the prayers in that moment. So there is no mention of that. We can't conclude this from the text itself. And this just reading into the text and putting a lot of um, a lot more information that we don't find simply here. And even if we just keep reading, there is no mention of that. And again, there, then many angels appear. Uh, there is no mention to other saints other than these 24 elders and these four living creatures, which uh, I'm pretty sure that not, no Catholic or Orthodox would say that these are three saints. Uh, but again, there are no, there is no mention to the myriads, myriads and thousands and thousands of saints that supposedly should already be in heaven. Uh, there is no mention of them. So where are they? And again, it's a non sequitur to conclude that the prayers of the saints, uh, which are in this golden bowl, somehow um, are can be heard of or can be be aware of or they can hear them, whatever. So that's the that's the point I wanted to make. Now. As I said before, if we go to 1 Corinthians 15 and then Hebrews 9, I'm well, going to actually go to 1 Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 9 because I think it's shorter. And it says here, uh, And as it is appointed for man to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who ugly away for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. And uh, now as you say here, it says that men die, all men will die once, and after this, there is judgment. Now, when the Bible talks about judgment, it talks about that final, the second coming of Christ. So that moment in which we all, both believers and non-believers, will appear in the presence of God and we're going to be judged according to our deeds. So Christians will be judged not for salvation. They will already be saved, but they will be judged according to their deeds, to their works, to for their works. Instead, non-believers will be judged um and for eternal separation for from God. So that's the idea. And you can see here that it's one after the other. So when men die, there isn't like a limbo, there isn't a place where believers stay, where they enjoy the presence of God. There is no mention of that here. There is just the mention of judgment. So they're all going to stay asleep. So they're all going to stay dead, in a sense, until the second coming of Christ, until that moment when we're all going to be raised up and we're all going to appear in front of uh, of uh, God. And again, First Corinthians actually helps and Paul just makes the case as to why this is going to happen. And if we move here to um, the um, the from, from, from verse from the second part, like Paul at the beginning says that Christ is indeed risen. So don't say that the dead don't raise from the dead because if that's the case, if Christ is not risen and if that's the case, then your faith is empty, it's void, it's useless. So we are the most pitiable of men if we just hope for this life. But uh, Christ is a reason. So that's the idea. And he's the first fruit of those who are falling asleep. Again, this falling asleep is a phrase that's used many times to refer to those that uh, fellow brothers and sisters who have already died. So have already um, died in Christ. So being believers. And uh, then it says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the death. For as in Adam will die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. And look here, he says, Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So you can see here that there is no uh, distinction, right? It's just at his coming, then all who are of his will all uh, be resurrected, will all be raised up. And then comes the end. You can see here how it's all in order, like right? there is no nothing that happens in between. Um, and that's when Christ is going to reign and uh, so forth. Now, if we go forward and then Paul talks about the uh, the body, he says here, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. 
disowned in dishonor, it is raised in glory. And again, what Paul is saying about raised is talking about that. He's talking about that resurrection of the dead that will happen when Christ will come. And again, this is not merely for believers. This is also for unbelievers. Because if we go to Revelation chapter 20, you can see here how uh, all unbelievers, uh, all people actually, will be uh, uh, will be going, standing before God. So everyone will be re going through this process of resurrection. But one resurrection is going to be for condemnation, for judgment, for punishment. Another one is the test going to be for eternal life. So that's the main difference. And then Paul continues, says, it is only dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is only in weakness, it is raised in power. It is only a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So Paul is just making distinction, right? Uh, so that they, they wouldn't get confused in saying, yeah, but it's already happened. We already we already have the spiritual bodies, right? Because some were uh, actually thinking that. Um, and uh, then Paul makes the case that um, we are going to have the exact same uh, glorified body that Jesus had. Because he says, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also be the image of the heavenly man. So the, the glorified body that Jesus had after the resurrection. And then Paul says, and now, this is a brethren, the flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall all not sleep, but we shall be changed. So here he says, he's talking about those who have already fallen asleep. Remember, these are the dead in Christ who have already fallen asleep, already passed away. He said, those who are not yet dead, when Christ is going to come, right? It's always referring about that day when Christ is going to come, the judgment day. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, the, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And again, here it says the dead will be raised incorruptible and, sh and sh we shall be changed. So that's at the moment of the trumpet sound, that's when the dead will be raised incorruptible. So that's when our fellow brothers and sisters will be raised, will have their immortal, incorruptible, glorified bodies. And, uh, uh, and we, so the people that are still alive when Christ is going to come, we are going to put on the corruption. We're going to put on, oh, sorry. We're going to put on immortality. Um, yeah, I don't know why I don't have this, but uh, we're going to put on immortality. And uh, and we're going to finally be in the presence of God forever. Uh, and this is the, uh, this is the, our hope, right? This is the thing that we should be uh, focusing on. And this is our victory, right? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I said, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abandon in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Um, and so you can see just by what Paul is saying, there is no mention that those who have died already in Christ have already been glorified, have already been raised, uh, and are already enjoying God's presence and are already in heaven. There is no mention of that. Actually, quite the contrary, that all those who are dead are going to be dead and they're all going to sleep until the moment that Jesus will come, until the moment of the last trumpet. That's when they're going to be risen up. And together, they, they have already died. And we, or the people that are going to be alive when this is going to happen, that's when we're going to be resurrected. That's when we're going to have our glorified bodies. And that's when we're going to finally be in the presence of our God forever and enjoying his presence. So again, this, this idea that the saints are already in heaven, are already glorified, already mortal, it's something that we can't deduce from scriptures. Uh, and, uh, and that's the second issue. So uh, let me think what you think about this, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. God bless you. And see ya. Bye-bye.